Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this afternoon um, for the migration seminar that we are hosting uh, this month in, in February. So my name is Laura Cleton. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the United Nations University Merit, and I'm convening this seminar series uh, on behalf of the United Nations University and Maastricht University in the Netherlands. So the migration seminar series invites researchers, practitioners, policymakers, uh, and others um, to discuss their work that relates to migration in uh, one capacity or the other. But before I'm going to introduce today's speaker, there is a bit of housekeeping that I need to do. So our speaker will talk for approximately 30 to 40 minutes um, today, after which we'll have time for discussion and questions from the audience. So I'd like to ask you to keep your questions until after our speaker is done uh, with their presentation. You can then either put your questions in the chat so that I will read them out loud for you, or you can raise your hand by using the raise your hand um, function uh, underneath your screen uh, in Zoom, and I'll then allocate turns. So in the meantime, please keep your microphones uh, muted. Um, your camera can be turned on if you like, uh, but as I said, be aware that we are recording this seminar today for distribution on our YouTube channel um, later on. On the YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of previous seminar series that, that we hold uh, in past years. So then let me introduce today's speakers to you. Um, I'm really, really happy to welcome uh, Emmanuel Garavello, who is an independent uh, consultant and migration specialist, um, and who has a history in especially operational and coordination roles uh, at both UN agencies, but also NGOs across Europe, but also on Asia, in Asia and the Middle East. So he currently provides consultancy services to governments and international organizations on topics related to migration management, refugee protection, labor migration, uh, and human trafficking. Um, Emmanuel today will present us with insights from years of experience uh, in implementing so-called complementary pathways um, projects, especially in Lebanon and Italy. And he'll of course tell you all about these projects um, in a second from now, um, and thereby also discuss um, what, let's say, uh, possibilities these programs offer for refugees to safely resettle, um, but also what problems and opportunities, right, people who implement these programs on the ground uh, face in the day-to-day -day work. Um, so without much further ado, I would really love to give the floor to you now, Emmanuel. Thanks so much again for being here today. And um, yeah, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Laura. It is really a pleasure to be here. And uh, it's a pleasure to to see you all here. Uh, yeah, let me let me start. First of all, I will share some um, some slide with you, and then we can start. Okay, can you see them correctly? Yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, as mentioned by Laura today, we will try to to discuss how we can protect vulnerable refugees to complementary pathways. And I will try to, to bring you some, uh, some insight from my experience on the field in implementing such projects, uh, both in uh, Europe and uh, abroad, especially in, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, first of all, I would like to start with um, spending a few words on complementary pathways and their role in respect to, to resettlements and especially to, to the current resettlement gaps. Um, and then on the second part of our discussion, I will deep dive into uh, a specific project that I've been part of, the Humanitarian Corridors, which is a project implemented between uh, Italy and uh, Lebanon for the safe travel and safe transferring of refugees uh, to Europe. Um, starting from complementary pathways, uh, but let me say something about resettlement first. Um, as you know, resettlement is the um, is the first tool um, used for the transfer of refugees from a from an asylum country to a third country. But also, as you as you might know, uh, unfortunately, there are several gaps, uh, especially. Um, as you can see on the screen, only 4.5% of eligible refugees are currently resettled. Uh, this is a number for, uh, from 2019, but it's pretty much the same uh, today uh, as of numbers. And yeah, this is a number even referring before the COVID-19 that changes a bit the, the, 
the the rates afterwards. Um, so it was estimated that 1.4 million refugees were eligible for resettlement, but only uh, four and a half percent of them were actually resettled. Um, there were much discussion uh, in, in the international community and uh, also with governments on how to scale up this gap. And complementary pathways uh, have been taken into consideration uh, to be used to, to complement resettlement uh, and to, in, in trying to scale up these numbers. Uh, please keep in mind, anyway, um, that complementary pathways are a tools that should not uh, that should be, as the, the, the word is saying, should be complementary to resettlement, uh, which remain the main tools to, to, to transfer refugees to, to third country. Um, complementary pathways were taken into consideration because potentially uh, they might provide refugees with uh, protection, with durable solution, and also to promote responsibility sharing between countries. Uh, those three are the, the three main goals also of resettlement and potentially complementary pathways might achieve the same goal. Uh, this is why many, many scholars, international organization and government take into consideration to, to use uh, this tool as a support to, to resettlement. Um, Complementary pathways is quite a recent term. Uh, basically, here you can see a definition by the UNHCR in saying the complementary pathways are safe and regulated avenues that complement refugee resettlement, as we were saying before, and by which refugees might be admitted in a country and they have the international protection needs met while they're able to support themselves to potentially reach a sustainable and lasting solution. This is the, the, the scholarly definition by the UNHCR. Um, but in order, I mean, th this is a very broad definition, as you as you may see. Uh, and in order to frame a bit more of our, our discussion, I would like to use this, um, this uh, subdivision here uh, in complementary pathways between those initiatives uh, leveraging on skills of refugees uh, to transfer them to third countries and those um, referring to the needs of the refugees. In particular, and talking about the, the so-called skill-based complementary pathways, those are initiatives that leverage on, on refugee skills, or, but also educational need to provide third country solutions. And as you can see there, um, a very good exa example of skill-based complementary pathways, which is the Talent Beyond Boundaries. Uh, this is an initiative um, which created a, a, a portal, basically, where uh, the, the need from employers in third countries can be um, can can meet uh, the need of skilled refugee to resettle and basically through this platform employers can hire skilled refugees and organize um, a safe travel from them in third country. Uh, another example that I would like to bring to you uh, concerning skill-based complementary pathways is this project here, uh, Unicore project, which means University Corridor for Refugees. This is a project in which I was involved in the implementation, and it was promoted by Italian University together with the UNHCR. Uh, well, basically, um, refugees were selected in uh, asylum countries and, uh, and were offered the possibility to continue their, their studies in Italy. Um, and also through the support of local NGO, um, basically these refugees were supported also by 
uh, tutor and social workers. My my role, for example, was to assist them from a from a legal point of view in everything concerning their documents, but also uh, the potential asylum application. And this is an interesting project. Uh, the last version of it provided uh, sixty nine refugees with the opportunity to. To be to be transferred to Italy to to continue their studies, but I mean, as you imagine, this so-called skill-based complementary pathways uh, refer to a very narrow uh, plethora of migrants and and refugees, and most of them are not included in them or, or cannot access them, unfortunately. And this is unfortunately even more true for those most vulnerable refugees. And this is why I also needed to, to, point, out, to point out and develop need-based complementary pathways, meaning those initiatives who provide a mission and protection for refugees on the, on the base of the of, of their needs and their vulnerability. Also in this area, there is um, quite a lot of examples. Um, some of them are some sort of humanitarian admission programs and some others uh, are the so-called private or community-based sponsorship programs. Also family reunification procedures and scheme might be added to this category here. Especially when I mention the so-called uh, private or community sponsorship program, uh, I obviously need to, to mention uh, arguably the, the long lasting uh, complementary pathways, pathway existing, meaning the Canadian private sponsorship of, of refugee program. Um, this program in particular was created in the late 70s and allowed 325,000 refugees to be transferred to Canada. It's quite interesting because it's, um, it's a collaboration between the Canadian government and private citizens. Um, most of the time organized through civil society organizations who basically sponsor the entry and the settlement process of refugees or households in the country of, of Canada. But then, um, taking on the example of this very last uh, community sponsorship program and mix it uh, with other humanitarian admission scheme, um, I can bring you the 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 example of the humanitarian corridor experience as a matter of fact as i as i mentioned it is some sort of private sponsorship based program um because it was born and it uh, and it is implemented by ngos from italy ngos which are connected to catholic and protestant church uh but also they use um the, the the tool of humanitarian visa to uh, allow refugees to access the the country and European Union so it was basically it was created in 2015 and it was created under the collaboration of these NGOs and the Italian Ministry of the Interior and Foreign Affairs um this program allowed, from 2016 up uh, until last year, allowed almost 4,000 refugees to be to be transferred uh, to be safely transferred to to the EU. Uh, let me just briefly mention the legal basis of this uh, this kind of project. Uh, basically, all the rules and responsibility between the actors is um, contained in a memorandum of understanding which is signed between the sponsor, meaning the, the NGO involved, and the Italian Ministry of the Interior, plus the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, but the most interesting part of this 
is that this kind of uh, scheme use the humanitarian visa uh, under Article 25 of the European Union uh, uh, Code Visa. Uh, this visa um, is basically it's um, it's a short term and uh, short term visa with uh, limited territorial validity um, that uh, an European state can issue on humanitarian ground. Unfortunately, both the procedure and what entails humanitarian ground is not clearly specified. And this is why, um, fortunately, this uh, uh, this tool uh, contains an, a very high level of discretionality upon the states. And maybe uh, this is why it's way underused, unfortunately, uh, since it is a very interesting instrument. Uh, talking about the beneficiaries, of uh, the humanitarian corridor. So, um, as I said, it is a project that its main objective was to safe transfer Syrian refugees from Lebanon to the EU in the aftermath of the of the Syrian civil war. And um, the NGO involved are directly responsible to select beneficiaries in Lebanon to a field office and field uh, case workers. Um, the selection goes uh, following a series of criteria, which can you see here on the screen, and, uh, and which they are uh, contained in the Memorandum of Understanding. Basically, uh, the, the vulnerable condition of refugees is highly taken into account, together with the um, eligibility to the to international protection. Um, both the refugee status uh, as intended in the Geneva 51 Convention, but also, uh, as you can see in the third point, persons facing serious threat of their life or human rights, meaning the European uh, subsidiary protection. Other criteria are taken into account in the selection, for example, the fact that the person has relatives in the countries, and we are talking about relatives, uh, not only fam uh, strictly family members, as in uh, family reunion schemes, but also, and very importantly, the capability of the people to go through an integration process in Europe which is really key. And uh, it determined the fact that this durable solution is really the right solution for these people. Uh, because not every refugee is present in Lebanon might, might want to use this durable solution, for example, or not. this is not a solution which would fit everyone. Uh, I remember, for example, if you think, uh, and this is based on a case that actually happened, I remember um, an old Syrian lady uh, living in a refugee camp in Lebanon uh, who lost her family during the war. Even though she was living in a refugee camp, the, the camp community was very close to her. And pretty much everyone was help, trying to help her. And she was... Even though she was living in humble condition, I mean, uh, she was living in dignity and close to other people, close to uh, people uh, with the same cultural background. So imagine now to transfer this lady uh, in, his, in her old uh, age to another country who, who she, she doesn't know, and maybe she, she will struggle to fit in. Uh, she will struggle to learn to, to, to learn the culture and to learn the language. So, um, I mean, this is difficult to tell if this would be the, the, the best durable solution for a person like this. Um, talking about beneficiaries, here you can see the, 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 the situation of Syrian refugees in Lebanon as for uh, 2021. So almost 800 and a half uh, thousand refugees 
are living in the country, especially as you can see in the eastern part, the, the red part of the Beka Valley and the Baalbek area. This is also the area where most refugee camps and informal settlements are situated, uh, as you can see here in the map. Uh, this is the map of the uh, situation of informal camps um, in the time the project started. Um, and as you can see, most of them are in the in the Becca Valley, which is the, the central part uh, that I the, 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 you can see with a lot of red dots. Um, most of Syrian refugees in Lebanon live in uh, informal camps. Um, most of them faces uh, severe condition in, uh, and a lot of barriers in uh, in integration because, unfortunately, as we as we saw. Um, it is difficult for Syrians to acquire uh, a legal residency status in uh, in Lebanon. Most of most of them uh, escaped uh, the war and uh, entered illegally in Lebanon, and most of them are still considered as illegal in the country, which means obviously uh, a lack of access in services, uh, job opportunities housing opportunities and so on and so forth and this especially this is unfortunately especially true also for Palestine refugees who previously were living in uh, in Syria there are other cases there are other situation uh, Syrian refugees live in uh, in better condition maybe households or individuals who had relatives in Lebanon or uh, we used to work in Lebanon even even before the the war, but unfortunately, most of them uh, can be found in a, a refugee camp like this. Uh, this is a picture from one of them in the Becca Valley. Um, case worker uh, from the NGOs that go through the the selection of beneficiary goes. Also to um, to make interviews with potential beneficiaries in refugee camps to assess the living conditions, and this is one of the refugee camps. As you can see over time, that the situation is improved. That the tent became became basically uh, informal buildings, but still uh, access to services is very limited. Here you can see basically the, the functioning. Of the of the project, um, so we 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 mentioned that the in the the, the process start with the identification and selection of beneficiaries, which is done by by NGOs through uh, staff on the field. Um, usually, the, the the staff members go through several interviews with the with the beneficiaries, and as I said, they. Also, some some sort of uh, visit to assess the living condition is included. Once the beneficiary is selected, then um, the organization involved go through the identification of hosting accommodation in the country of origin, taking also into consideration personal choices of refugees, but also uh, um, other criteria such as the presence of uh, relatives in cities or the necessity to access specific uh, health care. The third point is definitely important, which is the PD part of training. Um, here, the selected beneficiaries go through a training where uh, for example, I was um, involved in them, in, in preparing them and uh, informing on uh, the asylum procedure, because as soon as the beneficiary arrives in Europe, they lodge their asylum application. So um, informing them about their rights as asylum seeker was key. But also they went through specific training to, to prepare them for what they will face upon arrival in terms of uh, cultural diversity, in terms of uh, challenges in, um, 
in the integration pathways, but also opportunity. Once this part is done, transfer is set. And as mentioned, the asylum application is, uh, is lodged upon arrival. But this first part is just the, the, the start of the, of the, of the way longer uh, integration pathways that um, beneficiaries go through when they arrive in the country. Um, everything is up to the NGOs, it's also from a financial point of view, and also also regarding the integration, uh, the integration part of the project. Especially the beneficiary upon arrival in Italy, they are hosted in the um, so-called widespread reception system, uh, which is private, meaning uh, it's completely run by, by the own NGO. And it's widespread because it, they, they are hosted in ordinary flats and apartments, uh, basically to also to, to physically integrate beneficiaries in local communities. And plus, they are followed by social worker, psychologist, mediator, and other case worker through the uh, integration path by building uh, a personal um, a personal files and through classes, job opportunities, vocational training, Italian um, classes. They are basically guided through through the integration path. And this is uh, just a snapshot of one of the one of the arrival in Italy. Wrapping up, um, we saw that basically uh, complementary pathways, uh, we divided them in skill base and need base. As our focus was on vulnerable refugees, we might say that needs-based complementary pathways might have the, the possibility to provide uh, protection and durable solution for refugees because they, they can. And also another important thing to notice is that such regular admission can be achieved through existing legal instruments. So nothing needs to be changed as we saw uh, humanitarian visa already exist and they can be used to build such initiative. There are some challenges underlying this such in initiative and most of them, I need to be honest, uh, regard the integration part of the program. Um, because you know, uh, especially when we when we talk about vulnerable refugees, they usually have less instruments and more problems in uh, integrate themselves in the community. But basically, uh, as a, as an example, if uh, a lot of them uh, had health issues and they had to spend lots of time to, to deal with the health issues, even before considering learning Italian and start to find a job. And secondly, secondary movements are an issue that may also jeopardize uh, political will, because the um, projects like, like the Humanitarian Corridor were endorsed also because uh, the, the, the transfer uh, is supposed to, to go to Italy and the beneficiary are supposed to stay in Italy. Unfortunately though, there is quite a high level of secondary movement, meaning we saw a lot of beneficiaries that as soon as the, the transfer were made, they left to reach other communities or other relatives in other countries in Europe. Even though, uh, like, uh, if you remember, I talked about pre-departure training. Um, even though we spend a lot of time in informing them about the Dublin system and what the Dublin system entails, um, secondary movement happens. And also, 
it is very difficult to track them uh, because it's very rare that after uh, such beneficiary goes abroad, they it's very rare that they return to the to the to the NGO that uh, that provide them with the transfer, and so it's very difficult to track them to to check uh, where they where they went and if the secondary movement was successful. But also, as you can see, the number of, are pretty low. Low, I mean. 4,000, almost 4,000 refugees in six years of project, but still in 2021, 800,000 of refugees were still in Lebanon, as an example. Uh, and so, I mean, um, can such complementary pathways scale up uh, third country solution? Well, not with existing numbers, but everything goes to Another challenging point, which is obviously the political will, uh, because all of this, including resettlement, is up to the to the single states, and without the political will to to increase such number, uh, we can not go further from this. But there are though some regulatory developments that can be can be pointed out, and especially a wider use of the humanitarian visa. Um, but also, um, we must try to systematize private sponsorship program like this and to set standard to them. Uh, because we always need to ensure that they achieve the intended goal, and especially that they protect refugees and they provide um, durable solution from there. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much. And I leave it to you if you have any questions.